Good afternoon, Matt. Said, sit down. <laughs> Sorry. <about> that. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good to be back after a little bit of time on the road. Uh, start with some opening comments before I turn to questions. Earlier today, Secretary Blinken spoke to Qatari Prime Minister Al Thani and Egyptian Foreign Minister Abdullahi about tensions in the Middle East, the latest in a series of diplomatic engagements he has held over the past few days with counterparts in the region and around the world including calls yesterday with G7 foreign ministers and Iraqi Prime Minister Sudani. The Secretary has delivered a consistent message in all of these engagements. We are at a critical moment for the region, and it is important that all parties take steps over the coming days to refrain from escalation and calm tensions. Escalation is in no one's interest. It's not in the interest of any one country. It's not in the interest of the region. And it's certainly not in the interest of the millions of civilians who just want to live their lives free from violence and conflict. The Secretary is also making clear through these engagements that the United States continues to see a ceasefire in Gaza <clears throat> as the crucial step to helping calm broader tensions. In addition to, of course, securing the release of hostages and addressing the ongoing suffering of the Palestinian people in Gaza. And he is reiterating that all parties need to look for reasons to say yes to an agreement not look for reasons to delay or say no. As the Secretary has emphasized, this is an important moment for the region and it is critical that parties make the right decisions over the coming days. Turning to Bangladesh, we have seen the announcement that Prime Minister Hasina re resigned from her position and departed Bangladesh. We are monitoring the situation carefully. The United States stands with the people of Bangladesh. We urge all parties to refrain from further violence. Too many lives have been lost over the course of the past several weeks, and we urge calm and restraint in the days ahead. We welcome the announcement of an interim government and urge any transition be conducted in accordance with Bangladesh's laws. Finally, we are deeply saddened about the reports of human rights abuses, casualties, and injuries over the weekend and past weeks. We share our deepest condolences with those who lost loved ones and those who are suffering. With that. Yeah, um, thanks, Matt, uh, and welcome back. Thank you. Um, Same to you. Thank you. Um, on the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, you, your comments in, in the opening suggest that you are quite concerned about um, the risk or the, the, the potential for a, a much wider war. What exactly is the State Department doing in terms of preparation for um, that possibility. So we are concerned about the the risk of the conflict escalating, the conflict spreading. It's something, as you know, we've been concerned about since October 7th, and there have been various times uh, over the course of this conflict that the uh, risk has been especially acute. Now, of course, is one of those times. Um, and so what we are doing, um, the Secretary and others in the uh, State Department are communicating with all the relevant parties in the region to make clear, as I said in my opening remarks, that uh, escalation is in no one's interest. Um, and asking that people use their diplomatic relationships to make that clear to others okay, in, that's, that's, in, in the region. Okay, for this, the, my, my, my specific question, and I'm sure there's tons to say about your outreach to other countries, I'm talking about internally within the U.S. government, what uh, is being done to prepare for the possibility that um, sure. Uh, that there is a, a, a wider war and that there will be American citizens uh, in need. So there are a few different things. So um, let me take a broad answer to that before getting to the specific last one. Obviously, you've seen the, the Defense Department make certain announcements with regard to force posture. <clears throat> Deterrence is an important part of encouraging de-escalation. Um, and so we will continue to take steps uh, along that regard. Of course, we prepare for the possibility of further conflict. That being said, I want to just make it clear in answering the question that we don't think conflict is inevitable or should be inevitable or that increased conflict is inevitable. We're going to continue to work to try um, to prevent it from happening. But of course, we prepare for all um, possibilities. That has been the case um, uh, since October 7th. Obviously, you saw that um, over the weekend, we sent out a message to American citizens in Lebanon making clear that um, Lebanon is a do not travel country. It's a level four country. Uh, we uh, issued a security alert encouraging U.S. citizens who wish to depart Lebanon to book any ticket available for them, even uh, if that flight do does not apart depart immediately or does not follow their first choice route. Um, and we'll continue to monitor the situation and make assessments and take actions based on response to real-time events. 
All right. So last one. Um, you, you keep saying, or, you, or you're saying that a, a wider uh, war is not inevitable, and you don't think it should be inevitable. Um, but do you think that an Iranian response or an Iranian attack on Israel is inevitable, uh, whether or not that leads to yeah. a broader war? So I can't speak to um, what may or may not happen. That is a decision for Iran to make. We have. Uh, been sending consistent messages uh, through our diplomatic engagements, encouraging people to communicate to the government of Iran uh, that escalation is not in their interest and that we will defend Israel from attacks and that uh, escalation does not serve Iran's interest, just as it doesn't serve the interests of anyone in the right. region. So I don't want to say it's inevitable. Um, certainly the risk is there, and that's why we are, are pursuing these diplomatic in, engagements. In your, in, 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 from your perspective, is any kind of Iranian response an escalation? Um, I don't want to prejudge from here what our view of a response might be, other than to say we don't want to see Iran take further action. And that's the message we are consistently delivering to our partners in the region. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Thank you, Matt. Welcome back. Um, given some of the tough rhetoric that we've seen reported between the U.S. and Israel, specifically about whether the U.S. would bail out Israel should it escalate another time after this one, are there any limitations being placed on U.S. involvement in what's expected to develop in the company coming days? So I don't know what you mean by limitations. Uh, we have made clear that we will defend Israel against attacks from Iran, against attacks from terrorist groups. That is a part of our longstanding ironclad security to or our ironclad commitment to Israel's security. At the same time, as I made clear in my opening comments, as the Secretary made clear in comments he made on the road last week, we don't want to see any party take steps to escalate this conflict. By limitations, I mean there's a difference between intercepting and defensive actions versus engaging in counter strikes um, or even preemptive strikes, which have been floated by the Israelis as a possibility. Is there anything that the U.S. is drawing lines in front of in terms of those actions? So I'm not going to get into the conversations that we have um, with any of our allies or partners in the region, other than to say that as a general rule, we don't want to see escalation. Um, and that is a statement that applies to all parties to this conflict. Given uh, the Secretary's call as the President's personal outreach to uh, King Abdullah in Jordan, uh, can you say whether the Jordanians are as willing as they were in April to engage again in the coming days development? I I'm not going to speak to that in detail. Obviously, um, in April, we were able to put together a coalition of countries that uh, were willing to defend Israel against attacks from Iran. Uh, we do believe it's important to continue to defend Israel against attacks, whether they come from Iran or whether they come from uh, Iran's proxies. We, of course, have co uh, conversations with our allies and partners about that, but I'm not going to uh, detail those publicly. Again, I do want to say that we don't think these attacks should be inevitable. We don't think that they should happen. We don't think that they're in Iran's interests. But of course, it is prudent for us to take steps to deter uh, and eventually, if necessary, defend against those attacks should they occur. Without specifying countries individually, are you confident that you have at least the the same level of coalition that you had assembled in April? I, I, just, I just don't want to speak to it publicly. We are committed to the defense of, it, of Israel against attacks from Iran and its proxies, and I think I'll leave it at that. Okay, two more questions. One, uh, are there any preparations being made to evacuate U.S. citizens from Lebanon at this stage? So we um, always plan for all contingencies, and that's not just a statement I would make today. That is something that we have uh, has been clear since October 7th. We have planned for all of the possible contingencies, including the broadening of this conflict, including the escalation of this conflict. Um, our posture as it relates to American citizens in Lebanon today is that we recommend that uh, U.S. citizens who, um, uh, who can depart Lebanon find a way to do so. Okay, but nothing specific on the potential of an evacuation? I don't have anything to, to announce here, but as I said, we always prepare for all contingencies. Okay, and on, on prospects for a ceasefire deal, which this department and others, other agencies in the U.S. government have been stressing is a crucial key step. I mean, it appears notable that the talks over the weekend in Cairo were hours long. The CIA director was not there. Not to say that an absence of U.S., uh, uh, an altogether absence of the U.S. presence, but isn't that an indication that there's nowhere to go on ceasefire talks right now? I mean, how would you characterize them? Are they not stalled? So I wouldn't characterize them as stalled. Uh, I would characterize them the way we have said before, which is we have reached an agreement on the framework. That agreement still stands. Nothing that's happened over the course of the past week has done anything to erode the fundamental agreement on the framework uh, to this ceasefire. Um, that stands, but where we um, also what's true is that we continue to have other areas where we need to bridge the differences between the two parties. And so... Look, ultimately, 
It's not a decision the United States can make. It requires the parties to take these choices, and it requires the parties to get to yes, um, and not look for reasons to delay, and not look for reasons to say no. And so the message that we have consistently communicated to everyone in the region is we want to see a ceasefire. We think a ceasefire is in the interest of Israel. It's in the interest of the Israeli people. It's in the interest of the Palestinian people. It is in the interest of the broader region. So we are going to continue to use all of the diplomatic muscle all the influence that we can bring to bear to push to get this ceasefire over the line. And since this is the first time we're hearing from you specifically, I mean, would you say that the assassination of Hania, who was, of course, a lead negotiator in these talks, was at least not conclusive, not conducive to seeing them um, over the finish line? Uh, you know, the president spoke to this over the weekend, uh, and I think I'll let his words stand. We said it certainly didn't help. Okay, I have another one for um, Russia that later. Okay. Thanks. Jordan has, of course, been heavily engaged with the Iranians as well. President uh, Biden had a call today uh, with his counterpart in Jordan. Can you say if any messages to Iran have been disseminated through the Jordanians or any other channel urging de-escalation? So I will let um, all of the countries in the region speak to what diplomatic enga engagements they might have had with Iran. But obviously, one of the points of the engagements that we have had is to urge countries to pass messages to Iran and urge countries to make clear to Iran that it is very much not in their interest to escalate this conflict, that it is very much uh, not in their interest to launch another attack uh, on Israel. And so I'll let countries speak to the degree to which they've had those conversations, but I can tell you in the engagements that we have had, every engagement that the Secretary has had, uh, not just over the weekend, not just today, but going to, uh, through to last weekend, he has heard a consensus position from all of our allies and partners, both in the region and around the world, that they don't want to see the conflict escalated. So certainly I would expect that some of them would pass that message along and impress that point upon the government of Iran, but I'll let, to, I'll, let them, I'll let each individual country speak to their particular conversations. So there's a consensus, consensus position against escalation, but is there a consensus on whether Iran does have the right to launch any kind of retaliatory act? Uh, so uh, the consensus position is that Iran should not take further action. That's what we hear over and over, is that... Further action just raises the tensions, raises the risk of the conflict spreading and getting out of, a, out of hand. Look, when, the last time we found ourselves in this position when mm -hmm. Iran launched attacks um, uh, against Israel in mid-April, um, you saw a series of attacks and then ultimately the conflict didn't widen further. It's not to say that those attacks were in any way acceptable. Of course they weren't. That's why we'd help defend Israel against them. Um, but that was a moment of real peril for the region, and we were able to chart a path that ultimately um, got us through that time without it tipping into a wider war. But every time you have one of these cycles of escalation, you have a risk of parties miscalculating. You have them, uh, the risk of uh, them taking actions that get out of hand or that have unintended consequences, uh, and that can affect the ceasefire negotiations, it can affect um, the, the risk of broader conflict. And so the message that we are consistently sending is don't take this step. You don't need to, it doesn't serve anything, and it only puts the entire region at risk. Alex, go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Um, there does seem to be consensus uh, that something is coming and that something is coming soon. And I was wondering if you could speak to reports that the secretary told his counterparts, the G7, that this could happen today or tomorrow, and why you think uh, that, that the time frame essentially has shrunk compared to last time when Iran took a bit more time to prepare for their response. So I'm not going to speak to those reports. And again, as I've said, we don't think this attack should happen, and we are working to try to prevent it from happening. Um, so I'm not going to give you any kind of window, any kind of delineation of when we might be in a window or a potential window of attacks that we're trying to prevent in the first place. So that's the focus that we have is trying to impress upon everyone in the region that escalation is in no one's interest and they shouldn't take further escalatory steps. Have you seen any indication that Iran is preparing or Hezbollah is, is, is getting ready? I mean, obviously Hezbollah might be the more danger, dangerous party because they're closer and their stuff might be pre-positioned. So I'm not going to speak to any type of uh, intelligence assessments or other things that we might see, other than to note that Hezbollah consistently launches attacks across the border at Israel. It's not something that they would necessarily have to prepare for. You look at, every, you know, just about every day over the past few weeks, there have been attacks that Hezbollah has launched on Iran, so, or I'm sorry, on Israel. So it is an ongoing 
uh, it is an ongoing conflict across the blue line um, that we are attempting to manage and attempting to ultimately reach a diplomatic resolution to. And then just lastly, have you heard indications from Hamas after Hani's funeral now that they are going to come back to the table? Have they told the Qataris, the, the, the Egyptians, that they do plan to continue engaging? Um, I don't want to speak to the substance of, of negotiations other than to say that we continue to engage with our um, uh, Qatari counterparts, our Egyptian counterparts. As I said, the, the Secretary had a call with the, the Prime Minister of Qatar earlier today, who of course is one of the lead interlocutors, uh, and I think I'll leave it at that, other than to say the interlocutors, our interlocutors, Qatar and Egypt, are making clear to Hamas the same thing that we believe, which is that they need to continue to work to get to yes in an agreement. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just to, on, on those, so the Secretary had calls with, with the Egyptians and the Qataris. What are they saying about, um, you know, as, as has kind of come up, you've got one side, uh, they've, been, they've been the interlocutors in these negotiations, one side has just assassinated the lead negotiator, are they, are they willing to continue uh, hosting these talks when, you know, it seems like one side is, is sort of, um, has just taken an action that seems to threaten that, their position as, as mediator? They, they are. Um, and um, we continue to express our gratitude for the role that both Qatar and Egypt have played in trying to reach a resolution to this conflict and trying to reach a ceasefire that we eventually want to turn into an end to the war and, of course, beyond that, into broader uh, peace and stability. Um, both of those two governments have put an extraordinary amount of work into reaching a ceasefire, as we have put an extraordinary amount of work, and they remain committed to um, trying to push forward in negotiations uh, and reach an ultimate deal. And just on the question of, a, of an Iranian response, so in, a, in April, uh, you know, there was an attack on a, a an Israeli attack on, a, on an Iranian uh, diplomatic facility or, or consulate facility. I think at the time you didn't, there was never a conclusion from the US whether it was, uh, whether it did count as a consulate facility or not. Now we've got an attack on uh, Iranian territory. Do, do, they have, do the Iranians have the right to self-defense in this case? So I'm, I'm gonna answer that question this way. The right is one question, what's productive is another, and ultimately we don't think it's productive or conducive to anyone's interests, including Iran's, to conduct further actions, be they retaliatory or not. Um, any further action by Iran just raises the risk of increased tensions, it raises the risk of further response from Israel or from other parties, and ultimately gets us into this position that we have worried about from the beginning, that you get a conflict that can spiral out of control. Now, we are working to prevent that from happening, and I think the point that we are trying to make to all the parties involved is that they all have agency as well in trying to prevent that from becoming an eventuality. And so that requires all parties, including Iran, making the appropriate decisions in the days to come. Uh, and that means not taking steps that could lead to a wider conflict. Do you think it's incumbent upon them to, to uh, make those types of decisions? In the interest of consistency, though, would, you know, wouldn't your message to the Israelis is, is this is not helpful, or that's, the, that's the, the president's words. I guess people would expect you to maybe go a bit further than to say this is not helpful when you're making these kind of requests of, of the Iranians not to respond. I mean, the president, may, uh, the president said that he didn't believe it was helpful, and the secretary said uh, on Thursday uh, that all parties should stop taking uh, escalatory actions, and I don't think we could be any more clear than that. Just, oh, yeah. uh, just, just a brief follow-up on Alex's uh, line of question. Uh, at least one airline has said that they're going to avoid uh, airspace over Iran and Iraq in the coming days. Um, is that advice that's come from the United States? Is there an, a security assessment uh, for U.S. airlines in particular? That um, be, uh, I, I don't think it would fly over Iran. And, I, I would defer to the FAA to speak to that. It's not something that I'm aware of from here. So. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Welcome back. Thanks. Good to see you. Uh, Matt, uh, a new response to Libya and to Simon, as a matter of fact, you, you urged the Iranians, it's not in their interest to respond and so on. But uh, at least, do they have the right to respond? I mean, is that part of self defense? So, as I, I just answered that question, on the issue of self defense, I just answered that question in response right. to what he got from right. Simon. A right is one thing, right. uh, taking steps that are productive 
and are conducive to the interests of their people, right. that are conducive to the interests of the broader region, are another question. And in no way would a retaliatory action by Iran right. in any way serve the interests right. of the Iranian people or the broader region. And that's precisely why I'm asking you, because you, you mentioned the word right. So you are acknowledging that they do have the right to respond. No, I did not acknowledge that. Okay. I acknowledged so, the question. Okay, then let me ask you, um, if this was, let's say, happened in any of the Western capitals, wouldn't they be sort of obligated to respond? Uh, I'm not going to deal with a hypothetical Okay, side. all right. Uh, we'll deal with something real. Last week, uh, a week ago yesterday, Sunday, an errant uh, rocket hit, or maybe intentional, hit a, a small town of Medjil Shams, a Syrian town, Syrian citizens, and so on. And you said that Israel has a right to defend itself. I'm not you personally, but I'm saying. Yeah. So what's different? I mean, you know, everybody was, that all, everyone was saying Israel has a right to defend itself. Why doesn't Iran have a right to itself when the guest house, you know, I don't want to make comparisons, but it's like the guest house in London or maybe Blair House or anything. I mean, something that really touched the sovereignty of Iran. So I take the point of your question, Saeed. Um, it is not in any way, however, Right. useful at all for anyone in the region for Iran to consider taking such steps because of the risk, as I said, um, that this could um, uh, potentially get out of control. Mm -hmm. And that's the message we will continue to impress on them. All right. Let me ask you on the uh, negotiation. Why do you continue to have uh, uh, the notion that Israel is negotiating in good faith when, in fact, it, sh it killed the chief negotiator of the other party? I mean, if, if you go and shoot the, the chief negotiator, you kill him. You know, people must think that you are not very serious about negotiations. So the, I, I will speak to what we've seen in the negotiations, um, and that is, first of all, an agreement to the framework, and then some other issues that we are trying to resolve going forward. And mm -hmm. I'm not going to assess the motives of any of the parties involved. What I'm going to make clear is the position of the United States that we have impressed upon the government of Israel quite directly Mm -hmm. that they need to work to get to yes on this agreement. Okay. But, you know, uh, um, Israel is not even allowing the food to go in. I mean, things are, uh, aid is rotting, and they're not, they're not allowing anything to go in. And the situation is very, very dire uh, in Gaza. So if they're not even showing that kind of gesture, why should they be taking... So it's not uh, a question. So, so, Said, I'm a, uh, not quibble, but I think the... the, the it's not a premise. What you stated in the lead up to your question is not incorrect. Is is incorrect? Okay. It's not that they are blocking aid from coming in. They are letting aid come to the various crossings, right. and then we continue to struggle with the security situation inside right. Gaza of getting out of the crossings. And that's something that we're working through with the government of Israel and the various UN agencies. Okay. But ultimately, but ultimately, it is always going to be difficult. We've seen that right. now now nine months in, more than nine months into this conflict, and what we've seen is it is always going to be difficult because of the unique nature of Gaza and the unique nature of this conflict to move humanitarian assistance around when you're in the middle of a conflict between the IDF and uh, uh, a terrorist organization that continues to kind of pop uh, in and out of, of civilian infrastructure. And so that's why we continue to work for a ceasefire, because ultimately that is the way to solve this humanitarian crisis that currently plagues the people of Gaza. And finally, I have one last question. An Israeli uh, American soldier with a U.S. citizen uh, posted videos showing uh, detonation of, of Gaza homes and mosques and so on. Uh, is that, uh, in fact, it's something that uh, Amnesty called uh, a war crime. If this U.S. citizen comes to the United States, should he be arrested? Uh, that's a question for the Justice Department. Justice State Department. Department. But, okay, but is that is that a war crime if you show I cannot, that you so, have done that? So, so I, I can't, there's no way I can no. take any video oh. devoid of context okay. and pronounce judgment on whether it's a war Fair crime enough. or not from here. Yeah, yeah, can I just check on one thing? Yeah. Yeah. This, I think it was the third to last question that Saeed asked. Um, the premise of it Dad, was that Israel that had killed, had assassinated the top Hamas negotiator. Is that something that you're willing to accept and put on, you know, say on the record that it was in fact Israel that did it, uh, or have I, I have I missed something over the course so, of the last? So uh, I will let every country speak days. to their actions. The United States, for our part, was not involved uh, well, in any I'm way. I'm not asking if you in, were involved. I'm asking if you accept the premise of the question that Israel did, did in fact do it. If in fact the Israelis have told you that they were responsible. So I am not going to speak to what any other government may or may not have done. Um, I will make clear that the United States not only was not involved, but we were not aware of this incident before it occurred. Yeah, keep um, Sorry if this was asked before I walked in. And, not the but, first time. 
I don't mean with you in general. It happens. <laughs> right. Um, it's been reported that Iran has sent a message to Israel through a third party, obviously, that it will be attacking Israel. Do you think this is a good sign that at least if it's giving, you know, uh, a warning that it will definitely be attacking, that it could be a little maybe more limited and things stop there? Uh, so um, I'm not going to speak to that report. It's um, reportedly about conversations between two governments that are not the United States. I will let the countries involved uh, speak to it. I wouldn't want to speculate or comment on it. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, Alex. Thank you, Mike. Now you said uh, you expect each individual country in the region to speak up their mind, but Russia happens to be one of them, and Shoigu is in Tehran, I'm Russia sure is a Middle course. Eastern country. Well, I'm a regional country. Well, he said that he, <laughs> Just, he said that they a, are. It's a broad definition of the Middle East. Alex. Yeah, I mean, they share <laughs> well. overly broad. They are, they are I would willing say to, they are willing to cooperate. I'm quoting him in uh, dealing with current regional You're quoting, issues. You're quoting who? Uh, uh, Shoigu. Shoigu. Yeah. In Tehran. What is Russia's responsibility at this point? Uh, Russia's they, responsibility. I don't think we have any. So I'll leave the I'll aside the, the the question of responsibility. We don't have any expectations that Russia is going to play a productive role uh, in de-escalating tensions. We haven't seen them play a productive role uh, in this conflict since October seventh. They have, um, uh, for the most part, been absent, and certainly we've seen them do nothing to urge any party to take de-escalatory steps. They, they give the timing of this trip. Do you see this as an effort to undermine? your efforts. You know, to, uh, I don't know what the timing of this trip relates to. Obviously, um, you can look at this two ways. One is any involvement Russia might play in the conflict in the Middle East. And so far, we have seen them play really no role at all, certainly not any productive role. The other way to look at the possibility of this trip is it is for, uh, furthering uh, the relationship between the government of Iran and the government of Russia, and Russia going around tin cupping, looking for support for its illegal invasion of uh, Ukraine. I don't know what that's, that that's the purpose of this trip, um, but certainly we have seen that security relationship between uh, Iran and Russia before. We can we'll move to Ukraine when you're ready, if you want to come back to me. Uh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got it. Go ahead. Just a slightly different Do you see the UN statement today on UNRWA? Um, I saw it right before I come out. Uh, right before I came out, um, we haven't had a chance to. Um, I, un my understanding is there's an underlying report that we have not yet had right. a chance to, to review. So. Okay. Are you willing to comment on it now? No. Let, let, us, let us get a chance to look at the situation, and maybe tomorrow we can have something okay. uh, something to, to say. That question is Russia adjacent about detainees last week. Sure. So if you want to, okay. Sure. Um, one is there were conflicting characterizations of whether Alsukur Masheva was in fact um, officially designated as wrongfully oh. detained. Can you clarify? whether she was or not before she was she was designated as wrongfully detained when did that happen uh it happened last week uh shortly in the days before she was returned home okay and the family of mark fogel uh in legal proceedings against this department has argued that had he been designated as wrongfully detained it would have also led to his release do you have any comment on that so i'm not going to um uh, speak to questions that involve ongoing litigation for reasons uh, i think you can understand but I will speak to this issue in general. First of all, with respect to Mark Fogel, we are working to try to secure his release. We work to try to secure his release as part of this deal, uh, and we're unable to. But we continue to call for his release, and we continue to work to secure his release. And I think, let me just point to the events of last week to talk about our record, because I have a number of times um, stood up here and been pressed why we haven't designated certain individuals as wrongfully detained. I think Alex asked me two weeks ago about the wrongful designation of uh, Alsu Kermasheva, and I think asked me, you know, are we not designating her as wrongfully detained because she's a woman or because she's a Muslim? It's obviously not true, as I said at the time. And the point I made is we were when we say that we are working to get someone's release, we mean it. And our record backs it up. And sometimes we are working to obtain their release when they have officially received a wrongful de uh, detention determination. Sometimes there are other individuals who we say we're working to uh, secure their release, and they never receive that determination. A great example is Vladimir Karamurza, who was not determined by this department to be wrongfully detained, but yet we were still able to secure his release uh, last week. So let me just point to something the secretary said in the statement he released um, on Thursday when this news became public. And that's that he knows, he had a lot of difficult conversations, as you would imagine, right, with the families of those who have been uh, wrongfully detained and others who have been detained overseas over the past couple of years. And he can certainly understand that there were times that they worried that our efforts would not bear fruit. But 
We know they never gave up hope, and we didn't give up hope, and we continued to work to secure all of their release, and that is true with Mark Fogel, and that's true for every American who is wrongfully detained overseas. I, I certainly understand, and I'm not a lawyer for the family, that you know it's not maybe a prerequisite a, a requirement for uh, an American to be released, but it is a fact that three out of the four Americans in this case were designated as wrongfully detained, and, and that led to their release, as was Brittany Griner. So, just if there's anything else you want to say to the Fogel family at this particular so point. I would say to the family as you've heard from others in the administration that we continue to be committed to securing his release and we continue to work on it something that that we think about every day and the same thing that we said to the family of Paul Whelan when Brittany Griner was returned and we had tried to get Paul Whelan out as part of that deal and it just simply wasn't it wasn't on the table it wasn't on the table as part of that deal and we made clear to Paul and we made clear to his family that we had not forgotten him and that we would continue to work on his release, and that was true, and ultimately we were able to get him home. The same thing is true with Mark Fogel. We continue to work on his release. We really wanted to get him out as part of this deal. We're not the only party to the deal, right? Um, and we weren't able to do it, but we continue to work on it. And just with this question of wrongfully detained, not wrongfully detained, um, which we get asked about a lot for very understandable reasons, I would just note that there's, uh, there is a statutory review that we have to go through that lists certain factors that we have to apply when making the determination about whether someone is wrongfully detained or not. And we go through that and we have to apply the law rigorously and that's what we do. Um, but there are others who, for whatever reason, we have not made the determination at any one time. They have not met the statutory criteria. But if there's someone that we say um, that we're working to bring home, you know, like Vladimir Kuramurzo, we're working to bring him home and hopefully someday we will. Why was Karamaza not wrongfully detained? Um, uh, so, as always, I'm not going to speak to the determination with any one right. individual, but it's we have to go. We go through the statutory criteria with all of them, and add all that up and make a determination based on the facts of their case, based on the law that applies to their case, and based on the requirements of the Levinson Act. Does that all add up to a wrongful determination? And in the case of Al uh, uh the statutory review. Uh, led us to conclude it did. In the case of Vladimir Karamurza, it led us to conclude that it did not. That said, we still thought he ought to be released. Uh, we still pressed for his release. We were still, still able to get his release. Uh, designated day before or day after? Uh, it was sometime last week. I don't, we don't, I, don't, know I, don't, I, don't remember, I don't remember the exact day. It was sometime last week. But it did not happen before the decision was announced, right? I mean, the issue was released. Because I asked this question last week and we don't did not have the answer that she was designated. It, it happened uh, last week, shortly before her release. I'm not going to get into any, any further may, may time than move that. to Ukraine, please. Yeah. Um, now the F-16s are in Ukrainian hands. Uh, is the United States government willing to untie Ukraine's hands to strike back at you know, military uh, targets to prevent future attacks? Uh, to strike back in what? Russia. In yeah. Russia, mm -hmm. we have allowed the Ukrainian government to strike military targets in Russia. They are Alex. still able to strike from you know over 100 kilometers. You know, so, Alex, you and I have been through this before. My answer has not changed today, which is we constantly look at the needs of the Ukrainian military. We assess the security situation, and we try to be responsive to their needs. And that is a process that we have undergone from the beginning. And we make that process both, when, or we make those determinations both when it comes to the specific weapons that we provide Ukraine and the restrictions if any, that we put on the use of those weapons. Thank you. President Zelensky was quoted as saying that he wants NATO to discuss uh, Ukraine, the possibility of destroying missiles in Ukrainian territory. Why is it not uh, plausible in your eyes? Why is it not possible for... For NATO to, to, to you know... Uh, so that is a discussion that, with, as with all NATO, dis uh, NATO discussions, is um, uh, a discussion to be had among NATO members uh, and a decision that NATO would reach con uh, collectively. It's not something I can speak to from here. Thank you. My final one on Ukraine. Have you seen the video of uh, dismemberment of Ukrainian prisoners, uh, PAOs, in, in Russia? Uh, I, have, I have not. I have not. Go ahead. Thank you, Matt. On Bangladesh. Bangladesh is free at the cost of hundreds of lives under the shoot on site ordered by autocratic Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. But the situation is still unclear. Students, leaders, opposition parties, and the army are trying to form a civilian government. Could you please provide more insight into the U.S. position? Uh, so, as I said, a few things. Number one, um, our condolences, of course, go out to those who have been hurt uh, in the violence uh, over the past few weeks. Um, we are focused now on supporting an end to the violence uh, and for accountability. Um, 
All decisions regarding the interim government uh, should be made with respect to democratic principles, rule of law, and the will of the Bangladeshi people. Yeah, as you said, accountability. If Sheikh Hasina fled to India and she is trying to get any of the Western country, will you allow her to come into the U.S. as she commit uh, crime not, against humanist, humanity I, I, largely? I'm not aware of any request uh, of that oh, nature. Matt, yeah, go ahead. So guys, guys, yeah, one you. at a time. Uh, Matt, uh, the recent fall, uh, we already know, uh, Bangladesh government uh, led to widespread violence and uh, chaos. What measure is the U.S. State Department or U.S. taking to address the reported atrocities against minorities and general populace in uh, Bangladesh? So a few things. Number one, uh, I have made, as I made clear, what we are calling for today is an end to the violence and for accountability. Now, as to what accountability looks like, that's something that should take place uh, under Bangladeshi law. Obviously, anyone responsible for uh, acts of violence, uh, acts that break the law, should be held accountable for them. Thank you so much. Matt, Matt. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Matt, thanks. Uh, during the time that Bangladesh people, people struggle, struggle against uh, that fascist ruler and uh, thousands of people got killed, uh, you already informed us that she fled the country uh, this morning. I didn't inform you that, I think. Well, okay, uh, you, you said it, okay. Said she, uh, I said we've seen the announcement she resigned. Okay, yeah. uh, she resigned, okay. Uh, after she left, there is a dozens of dead bodies are pulling out from the Gone of Auburn, the official residence of Prime Minister. There's a dozens of dead bodies are pulling out next to the parliament. There's a lots of atrocities are taking place by the government official, those who are still in power, especially a couple of people. Uh, Army Chief of Staff General Wakaru Zaman, he was involved uh, with genocide. Um, Navy Chief Admiral Mohammed Nazmul Hassan, he was involved with the genocide. Air Chief Marshal, Hassan Mahmoud Khan, they were involved with the genocide. And they're the same people are saying, we are going to the president and form a caretaker government. So as a matter of fact, when was the last time we heard a killer is going to do the justice for another killer? So let me say a few things. Number one, with respect to um, the violence over the past few weeks and the deaths that have occurred, it is vital that we have full and transparent investigations to ensure accountability for these deaths. Uh, sec sec second, as it relates to the interim government, as I made clear in my opening remarks, we think that it's important that um, uh, we focus on the Bangladeshi people's democratic aspirations and see uh, um, uh, a path to democratic governance. Uh, does America support Bangladesh military to install a caretaker government? Uh, we want to see the Bangladeshi people decide the future of the Bangladeshi government. Thank uh, you. Jenny. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, um, just uh, have there been any, uh, has there been any contact, as far as you know, with Bangladeshi officials, uh, be it in the military or in the uh, the former government? Or uh, I don't have any to report today. There may have been contacts from our embassy, but I'm not aware of any. don't have any to announce. Um, and, and just also in terms of uh, some U.S. issues with Bangladesh, the issue of the Rohingya, of course, has been something that's, that's been quite important between the U.S. and Bangladesh. Do you, do you, is there any concern that this would impact the, the, the housing of the Rohingya refugees? Um, so I think, as you know, the United States has provided I'm going to try to do the number from uh, memory here. I think it's around $2 billion to assist with um, uh, refugees in Bangladesh. And um, I don't have any immediate comment on how this change of government might affect those programs. I would certainly hope that it wouldn't. Um, uh, we think it's important that um, uh, Bangladesh continue to provide hospitality um, to those refugees and will continue to uh, work with them to do so. And and Bangladesh, uh, no, hold on. Hold, guys, hold on. Uh, Simon, did you have a... Yeah, uh, well, Matt, uh, uh, Sean asked most of my questions, but I did want to ask on, uh, is, there, is there ongoing uh, assistance to Bangladesh, both uh, in terms of humanitarian aid that will, con will continue and also, um, you know, military, will military assistance continue given... I guess there's, this is not a coup, but there's questions over the, the transfer of power. Yeah, so certainly with re with respect to the kind of, uh, 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 you know, um, illusion in the last part of your question. So we've seen all, all that we know right now is we've seen the announcement from the government that she resigned. We don't have any further uh, information about how that resignation may, may have taken place. With respect to, and that goes to the, the question, uh, obviously, of financial support. So with respect to financial support in uh, fiscal year 2023, the United States provided over $212 million in bilateral economic development and health assistance to Bangladesh. Obviously, this, uh, I don't have any announcements with respect to those programs, other than that we would like to see them continue because they're important 
um, to uh, our relationship with the people of Bangladesh. And just to confirm my, the, the question Sean answered, it was um, we provided nearly two, bil nearly two billion humanitarian assistance to support Rohingya refugees since August of uh, 2017. Can I just uh, take uh, just, just another uh, question on that? Uh, just taking a step back a little bit. I mean, how do you actually feel about the Army's role? Uh, how does the United States feel? Do you think that they were productive in this? Is there any concern that an interim role could become more than an interim role? Well? Um, so let me answer that two ways. One, with respect to their role over the past several days, we have seen the reports that the army resisted calls to uh, crack down on the protesters, and if those reports are true, certainly that is something that we would encourage. We don't. Um, we made clear, I think, for several weeks now that um, people have a legitimate right to protest and to peacefully assemble, and we opposed any kind of violent crackdown. So, if it is true, in fact, that the army resisted calls um, to crack down on um, uh, on lawful protesters, that would be a positive development. With respect to, to where we go from here, um, what we want to see is democratic order. We want to see the Bangladeshi people choose their uh, own government, and that's what we'll be, we'll be looking for in the days and weeks ahead. Yeah, follow up in Let me go to Jenny. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, two questions. North Korea announced that uh, it will deploy a large-scale tactical nuclear ballistic missile launcher to the front lines. What do you think of North Korea's sudden actions? We would encourage North Korea to discontinue taking provocative uh, and unproductive steps and return to the negotiating table. Do you think uh, North Korea is uh, seventh nuclear test is imminent? Uh, I don't have any assessment to offer on that. A quick uh, question. North Korea is currently uh, experiencing many casualties due to flood. South Korea said it would provide humanitarian aid, but North Korea tools only support from Russia. What do you think of North Korea, which selectively chooses humanitarian aid? So obviously our thoughts are always with the people of North Korea as they are with the people of any country around the world when they suffer a humanitarian disaster. And whatever differences we have with any government, um, those are not differences with the people of that country. And so we would hope um, to see the humanitarian needs of the North Korean people addressed. Um, and I'll let um, South Korea speak to uh, decisions or offers that they might have made. Thank you. Eva, yes, Matt. I know you didn't want to answer a question about the limitations, on whether there are limitations on U.S. support to Israel. But my question, when you say that no one, and your message is no one should say no to de-escalation, is it applicable to everyone? Is it applicable to all parties? Is this your message to Israel? Yeah. I mean, it, yes. My statement when I said all parties, I very much meant all parties, as did the secretary when he spoke to this last week. Thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead, and then I'll go. I'll go. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, the Iranian Security Council members spoke to Al Kuwait's Al Jazeera newspaper, and they said that a delegation, a U.S. delegation, has visited Iran through Turkey with a mediation of Oman. What's your comment on that? And has anyone from the State Department or the U.S. government spoke directly with the Iranians on this issue? Um, so with respect to Iran, we've always said we have the ability to send messages to them or to get messages to them when it's our in, in our interest to do so, and I will leave it at that. And last time when the Iran attacked Israel on April 13, they said they claimed that they sent wide notes to everyone, including the U.S., the said the U.S. that they are going to attack Israel. Have you received any notification from Iran so, on this? So let me just say uh, a number of things that um, there were reports about what Iran said to us last time that proved to be completely untrue. There were, you may remember this, that there were a number of things the Iranian government put out that just flat about messages they sent to us that just weren't flatly were false. Um, and with respect to any communications, uh, I'm not going to speak to them now, other than to say um, you should be highly skeptical, as always, about reports of what the Iranian government may or may not have sent to us in the message through an intermediary, a third party, or, or otherwise. And, and last thing, and how, how did Iran receive your messages through your diplomatic engagements? Um, I will let uh, the countries who are party to those diplomatic engagements speak to that. As I said, and I think in response to one of the questions earlier, 
We are making clear to all of our allies and partners in the region and beyond who have diplomatic engagements with Iran that they should press Iran um, to take de-escalatory steps and refrain from further escalation. Uh, but I'll let those countries involved speak to any specific Thank conversations. You. Ryan. Thanks, Matt. Uh, not, not sure if you saw there was a report in Semaphore that the Wall Street Journal uh, tried valiantly to try to confirm its reporting on the UNRWA allegations made by Israel. Yeah. Talk to American intelligence sources, Israeli intelligence sources, were completely unable to substantiate them. Uh, does the State Department have anything new about those UNRWA allegations? And in the future, will the State Department consider allegations coming from Israel differently, given that these have not yet been backed up, but such drastic measures? So I did see that report. And I think it is a good time to remind everyone that the action that we took was not in response to information that the government of Israel brought to us. It was in response to UNRWA coming to us and UNRWA saying that they had received these allegations from the government of Israel and they found them credible. And so that was what made us, that was what led us to make the decision that we made. It wasn't getting anything from the government of Israel. It was when UNRWA itself said they found the allegations credible that we thought it was an appropriate step to take to uh, pause the funding. Now, with respect to the underlying investigation, so if Sean asked me about it, I believe the UN has issued a statement um, uh, about it earlier today. We have not yet had a chance to review either the statement or what I understand to be an underlying report, but we'll certainly do so over the coming days, and we'll leave it until, until we've had a chance to do so to pass judgment. And the IDF also announced uh, that they assassinated the Gaza uh, Minister of the Economy. I'm curious if does the State Department consider somebody like that to be a combatant? So I do. I, I didn't see that announcement. I don't know who the person was. I don't know if he had an active role in the you know Hamas military wing or not. So I would to, but, to be able to answer that question, I'd have to know more about this specific. They said person. his. They said his. They said he counts because he had a role over the economy, and the economy is has a role over manufacturing, and within manufacturing, there are weapons that are manufactured. Again, I would ha I'd have to look at it in more detail before I could give you uh, any kind of detailed assessment. Um, go ahead in the back. Good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, I have just that. a follow-up. Uh, is uh, There is a transition period off from a caretaker government in Bangladesh. Does America have any plan to assist Bangladesh in rebuild its economy? Does it have plans to what? Does the U.S. have plans to what? I didn't catch the uh, last part. Re rebuilding its uh, economy. So we greatly value our relationship with the people of Bangladesh, um, and we want to see that continue. But I would just urge everyone with requests or, or questions about what the future may entail. We are not even 12 hours out from the reported resignation of the prime minister. So I would encourage everyone to just with respectfully take a beat before making any kind of long-term uh, assessments. Go ahead. Um, just to follow up on the ceasefire negotiations, you said they're not stalled. Do you, what are you basing this answer on? Are you getting any signs from any government in the region that they're pressing either the Palestinians or the Israelis to actually agree to the ceasefire? Uh, so it is based on uh, our conversations with the other interlocutors is based on our conversations with the government of Qatar, with the government of Egypt. Now, that's not to say we've come to agreement on all of the underlying issues. We clearly haven't. Uh, we need to bridge those differences, uh, but we continue to work through it productively with uh, uh, the interlocutors. We know they are pressing Hamas to accept a deal, just as we are pressing Israel to reach a deal, um, because we think it's important to do so, and that's what we're going to continue to do in the days ahead. And, and, and yeah, do you sorry. think it's possible to press Israel, given that um, there, it doesn't seem to be in Netanyahu's interest at this point to reach a ceasefire. At least that's what the Israeli media is saying. That's what a lot of Israeli officials are saying. So the media says a lot of things. Officials say a lot of things. We believe it is very clearly in the interests of the Israeli people, and that's why, among the reasons why we'll continue to push for it. Livy, go ahead, and then we'll wrap for today. What's new about the media reports out of Israel is that now you have the head of the IDF, Shin Bet, and Mossad being quoted as confronting the prime minister and basically saying, you know, either give us something to go on or there's going to be no deal. That's a paraphrase. Yeah. Um, but does the U.S. not view those reports as credible? So I am never going to speak to uh, reports about machinations inside any other government where I don't know whether the veracity of those underlying reports. And ultimately, it doesn't change what we're trying to do, and it doesn't change our approach, which is what we're trying to do is reach a ceasefire, and what, the way we're approaching it is continue to work uh, with the parties to try to get one over the line. Nothing about those reports um, changes our goal. So but is that not an exercise in futility if the de facto leader of the country we is don't, reluctant to We, we do not deal? believe it is. Look, um, 
president had a very di uh, direct, candid conversation with the prime minister about this last week. Um, and we will continue to engage with them to make clear that we believe a ceasefire is in their interest, just as we believe it's in the interest of the Palestinian people and work to get one over the line. And with that, we'll wrap for today. Thanks, everyone. Uh, oh, do you have one more? Can we Sorry. just talk about Venezuela? Uh, yeah. For a moment. It's, it's important. Uh, the, um, yeah, how did the, we go through without, not, without well, getting a question? I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm here There's a lot too, going uh, on today, yeah. <laughs> uh, but can I just ask, um, the Secretary had the, the call and the statement uh, last week uh, with the, the opposition there. Uh, is the U.S. ready to recognize um, another interim president similar to what happened earlier with Guaido, or is it more just a matter of not recognizing uh, Maduro as the victim? That's not a step that we are taking today. Um, what we, uh, what we, where we are today is we are in close contact with our partners in, uh, in the region, uh, especially with Brazil, Mexico, and Colombia, uh, about a path forward. Um, we continue to urge the Venezuelan parties to begin discussions on a peaceful transition back to democratic norms. Um, we continue to call for transparency and the release of detailed tally votes while recognizing it's been over a week since the election and any release of those votes would require close scrutiny given the, the potential for tampering or manipulation in that time frame. So um, no, that's not a step that we've taken uh, as of yet, but we continue to make clear that the will of the Venezuelan people needs to be respected and that's what we're engaging with our partners in the region uh, about. Sure. And uh, just uh, do you have any reaction to the EU today? So it won't recognize the, the, the results. Is there is there a press for it, it, what's the U.S. call for other countries in terms of how to approach Venezuela? Is there also an idea that perhaps other countries should take steps of not recognizing Maduro as the victor? So we would want we would hope to see all parties take the steps that we have done, which is to call to full call for full transparency to um, ask for the full results to be released. Um, and then ultimately to begin discussions about a transition back to democratic norms. That's what we're encouraging. It's what we're discussing with our partners in the region and our partners around the world. Uh, and we hope all, all countries would adopt that. Ultimately, you know, this is a question about respecting the will of the Venezuelan people. And as we concluded, and you saw in the statement that we released last week, when you look at the tallies that the opposition made public, um, it's clear that even if every outstanding vote came back from Maduro, it wouldn't be enough to overcome the advantage that um, uh, Edmundo Gonzalez uh, had. And obviously saw the report in the Washington Post concluding the same thing uh, over the weekend. And so we're going to continue to pr uh, push for respect for the will or the, the will and the votes, actually, of the Venezuelan people. So, Alex, uh, you know? While we've been in here, I was just sent um, videos from Russian state media of the apprehensions of both Whelan and Gershkovich. I'm wondering if you've seen them and have any reaction to them. The Whelan one shows him appearing to accept a thumb drive before his arrest with, by masked men. Have you seen these videos? So I'm going to uh, uh, rely on a rule I established in my very first briefing, which is anything that breaks while I'm up at the podium, uh, I'm going to take a moment, step off the podium and comment on. So I'll be, uh, next time I'm back up here, I'll be happy to comment on that. But uh, no, if it's something that broke while I was here, I have not seen them. And so wouldn't. Uh, wouldn't I, I, don't, I don't know if it broke beforehand. I was just. Yeah, I, I have not seen them. So okay. I assume it broke while Thank I was you. up here. So with that, thanks, everyone. Thank you.